There is 
that have a timeline of the Free Southern Theater and also Junebug Productions. It's hanging right out here on this side. And we have some students that are here. They're part of the social innovation class. And so they took on the challenge. They asked us the question, what is the challenge that Junebug is facing right now? And I said, well, beyond money and resources and time. She said, yes, what else? <laughs> so I told them one of the things was we were planning this convening. We wanted to look at documentation, but we wanted something that wasn't stale. We wanted something that was fully participatory. And this is what the students created, this interactive sort of timeline. So they will find you and they will ask, they will say, hey, can you come and take a picture? You get a picture to keep with yourself and a picture to pin right up on this timeline about where you intersected and you tell your story about how you were intersected. So we want you to do that at your leisure. You will see this here and you will also see it at the Ashe Cultural Arts Center up on the wall. So have a good time with it. Remember your stories. It's going to make you remember things that happened, right? But 50 years ago, you know, it wasn't exactly yesterday, right? So there's another group of people that came. Um, they are, where am I? This is my documentation team. Can I have you come out? They're behind some places. Can you raise your hand? My documentation team right here. So we have Mr. Chenis Pettigrew. We have Jason Foster. We have Ethan Johnson. And we have Lizzie Cooper Davis. And then we have Melissa Cardona. This happens in a couple of ways. They will be, yes documenting the entire thing. It is also being live streamed for today and on Sunday. And then they also may pull your coattail and ask to do an interview. And so they're going to have a little interview station over there. If they pull your coattail and ask you to come, if you feel like it, then we would love for you to share your story and your time with us. And then beyond that, Ms. Melissa Cardona will be taking some wonderful photographs. I wanted you to put a face to the name so that you knew all the different ways that this is happening. And of course, if anybody is against that, then please let us know. And of course, we'll honor what it is that you're feeling at that time. Are we good with that? Yes. Yes? So we got one more thing to show. Inside your packet, you will notice beyond all of the stuff that's happening in New Orleans, because this weekend in New Orleans, let me just share with you, is like the perfect storm of events all happening this particular weekend. So we've just taken the ability to just, we took that opportunity to share with you some of the things that are happening in and around the place. Um, there is a form, it's an intake form that's there that has some questions um, for you. We would like for you to fill that out. This is a way for us to kind of, for you to share your story in a different way. Um, it has a list of questions, they're very brief questions. If you would be so kind as to fill that out, and I see already, Lizzie, can you hold that up? Someone was a wonderful person and filled it out already and turned it in. So let's just follow that model, if you will. Just fill that out, and Lizzie Cooper Davis is the person that you want to hand that to. Okay, if you have any questions, we have our interns that are out here. Matter of fact, if I get somebody to knock on that door really quickly and have them come in, I want you to know that this weekend was really done and put together by a tremendous amount of volunteer support. I gotta put an emphasis on that. Volunteer support. And my two interns right here have been rock stars through that. So I just wanna take time to acknowledge and to thank you so much for sharing your time and your energy. Thank you. So with that, I would love to bring to the stage my friend, my colleague, Ms. Tafara Waller Muhammad. Good morning again. Good morning. So, um, like Stephanie said, my name is Tafara and I work at the Highlander Research and Education Center in New Market, Tennessee. I'm the lead of cultural programs there. So I have the distinct honor of um, driving my cane and um, thank you. And 
helping to have a conversation with people that are equivalent to rock stars to me in my mind as a child that grew up in a black theater. So if I get a little, if I start to stutter, it's really because I'm in awe and I'm kind of <laughs> having a moment. Um, so I would like to um, call these individuals to the stage. I would like to call Mr. John O'Neill. I first met John O'Neill, I was about five years old. And uh, <laughs> he doesn't remember, but he came to my home community and did a, a storytelling workshop with the kids in my neighborhood. And recently, Mr. Um, Mr. John uh, <laughs> came up to me and he said, uh, yeah, you're from Little Rock. I know a man named Bill Robinson from Little Rock. Do you know him? I said, that's my papa. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Mr. John O'Neill, one of the founders of the um, Free Southern Theater. The next person that I would like to call to the stage is Dr. Doris Derby. but I have read her writing, so I'm very excited. So, the next person that I would like to call to the stage is Mr. Roscoe Orman. <laughs> and the next person is Dr. Jerry Warren. with our elders. Is that all right? Yes. Because we're going to have to pass this microphone. So, give that to her. All right, so we, we're just going to have a conversation with our elders. We know that you have their bios and your booklet. And we know that we're a little bit behind time, so we're going to try to make the best of what we got. Y'all ready? All right. So, y'all ready? You want to say something before we start? All right. So this is the, the first question that we have prepared. Why did the Free Southern Theater arise at Tula? What happened? It was her fault. <laughs> Talk about it. It was her fault. <laughs> it about 3 o'clock one morning in Jackson. Doris and I were working together at um, the, 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 uh, uh, the adult literacy project. <laughs> we would, our, our turn was to write a book that people who, adults who did not know how to read, could read when they got through reading it. <laughs> we kind of failed at that job. <laughs> but we had a good time trying it together. And, um, we were, uh, Gilbert Moses, rest his soul, uh, and I had fallen into a friendship of a strange nature. <laughs> we fought all the time on virtually everything, <laughs> but it was a friendship. <laughs> and uh, one night we were sitting at the apartment we shared on, um, what, what street was that? <laughs> the, the Maple Street, it was the Maple Street of Oklahoma, yeah. And uh, uh, we would have, we invited Doris over for dinner. Doris, uh, we knew to be uh, a visual artist. I'm just thinking about it. Just thinking and uh, we've been talking about theater because we felt like theater was uh, the art form that included everything, all the arts. And so we thought it would be a good place to hang a whole bunch of hats. <clears throat> and uh, by 
three o'clock in the morning, we've been talking about theater. And Doris said, well, she has amazing capacity to sum up stuff. If theater means anything, anywhere, it should certainly mean something here. Why don't we start a theater? Silence fell into the room. Gilbert did this all the time when he was sitting down. <laughs> and I did too. <laughs> so we were sitting there shaking, the shaking stopped. We looked at each other. We ended up looking at Doris. Uh, there was no answer but to say, I guess you're right. <laughs> so, Papa, can Dr. Derby talk a little bit about um, the initial vision around the theater? Well, I'm from New York, and I was very active in theater circles in terms of going to all the off Broadway black theaters, uh, performances, and very much involved with uh, uh, black artists. Um, I've always thought my mission was to um, make sure folk to identify and to create a place, um, whatever it was, and documentation for the black arts and black history. Because uh, growing up in predominantly white um, elementary, junior high, and high school, uh, I didn't feel that there was enough. So I was around with dancers, artists, theater people. So when I went to Mississippi and we were in the Literacy Project, we were supposed to be developing um, programmed instruction materials for adults to learn how to read, especially to pass the literacy tests that were required for uh, to pass in order to register the vote and to vote. And so this was an adult literacy project based at Tulu College uh, for one year. So um, I was also uh, working with Kofo Smith in, in Jackson and just trying to uh, be where, be available to um, whatever was needed. But John and Gilbert and I, seem to have a lot in common in terms of the arts and goals, all of us uh, being interested in, in furthering the education. And we saw the Free Southern Theater as a vehicle to um, promote education uh, and as John said, an umbrella. And the umbrella as a place where we would be able to incorporate all of the arts, with music, dance, visual, and the theater. Um, and we were talking about how the theater could be a vehicle to, to uh, you know, travel around and take a message and involve participation in uh, the movement and in um, areas of critical thinking and creative expression. Because it was such a blackout, quote, blackout, of information uh, in Mississippi. And, you know, the TVs, TV station was controlled. Uh, the newspaper was controlled, the films were controlled. You didn't see any, you, you, you just saw so little that was relevant to black people and our um, um, being able to accomplish things. Um, so we thought that the theater, a, a theater that would uh, be able to turn around and work in con connection with the civil rights movement would be a, a perfect fit. And um, I always have been a pioneer and, and a, a do-it-yourself person. Got that from my, my parents, my grandparents. If it's not there, then, and you want it, make sure that it gets there. And so that's what we, that's what we do. And so if it's not here, let's see how we do it dream up a way for it to actually exist. 
So what had to happen in order for the theater to even manifest? How did it move from the conversation in the living room at dinner? Well, Tula was a perfect place because um, Tulu College was a haven for civil rights workers, for uh, students who were you know, organizing and participating in demonstrations, etc. Uh, it was a small black college that had um, the administration was in full support of the movement, and uh, you had professors there, and particularly Bill Hutchinson, who was the head of the drama department, was very interested in and talking about it and supporting us. We had students who their imagination was like, oh wow, this is a great idea. Um, we want to participate. Um, and and Kofo and SNCC, uh, they were behind us. Uh, anything that we could do to expand the horizons and, and be there to promote the civil rights movement and struggle, um, it just all came together. And the Tulu College was so supportive of the whole, the whole um, you know, idea and, and project. Um, the students were just fantastic. The faculty was fantastic. The administration um, gave us resources, and so that's how we were able to, to pull it off. Mm -hmm. Jerry was a student. Jerry, yeah, definitely was a student, a senior. Um, Jerry, you want to talk about it from the perspective of students? You're taking my questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what most people do. <laughs> uh, I was uh, 20 years old, a uh, senior mathematics major who had a great interest in writing and um, visual arts. And uh, Bill Hutchinson, who's been mentioned, did ask me to participate in some rather special conversations about the uh, perspectives that was being shaped for uh, FST. <coughs> and I agreed to do that. Now, if you find me looking at this piece of paper, I don't trust my memory, so I wrote it all down. <laughs> uh, and I guess the question was, is this really a feasible uh, project uh, that really could help us to do critical thinking about the condition our condition was in in Mississippi at that time, in a very segregated uh, and uh, closed society, as uh, Doris has said. So at our own meetings, I reviewed these uh, initial drafts of the proposal with the uh, uh, Bill and uh, Doris Gilbert and uh, John. And what struck me was that I had been uh, doing things with drama for some time, but I had never thought of drama as a weapon. In fact, that had never occurred to me, so this was rather a new, new idea. And then behind that uh, amazement was, was my usual skepticism, where I said, well, isn't the bloody drama that we're all a part of enough? Um, you know, I mean, we had people taking very risky uh, measures, making great sacrifices, coming back to campus bloody and bandaged, and uh, the local people. of the civil rights movement and the mega narrative, but the little people in Mississippi were doing things, and they had to stay there. Other people would come and go, they had to stay there. That was a part of what, as a student, I felt I admired the SNCC workers tremendously, and of course, we had to all overcome what I call the paralysis of profound fear. You don't know the paralysis of profound fear in 2013. The shutdown of the government was kindergarten mm -hmm. compared to what we had to go through. So wasn't this emotional cost of empathy drama enough? Obviously not. I had tremendous admiration for Doris uh, as a person because she was 
brilliant and brave. And I often laughed at John's philosophical pronouncements. That's why that literacy book didn't get written, because no one would have been able to read it. <laughs> <laughs> and through the uh, other institution we had on campus, which was the Social Science Forum, uh, sponsored by Dr. Ernst Berinsky, I had met Gilbert, and I liked Gilbert because he was so bad and bold and spoke up said what was on his mind. So my admiration for these people, in addition to other interests, led me to say, yes, Tougaloo should give as much support to this enterprise as possible. The college had a strong tradition, going back to 1869, of supporting forms of resistance, of being a thorn in the side of white supremacist Mississippi. And everyone there learned sooner or later that we had to resist gross injustice. It was the right space then for developing and implementing theater or drama as a form of education about social evils, state-supported terrorism, and I'm going to come back to that at some point, state-supported terrorism. You think that's new? We should have been born in Mississippi. And our entitlement that would have a Berlin Wall between us and them, our entitlement yeah. to constitutional rights, our nation has yeah. been since it came in to disturb indigenous peoples, a nation of hypocrites. So cultivating yeah. non academic audiences, people who didn't have attending Tugulu College, but who had genuine interest in their freedom. To break the theater to them was very, very important. It was a capital idea, but more than that, it was a moral thing to do. Thank you very much, Dr. Moore. I would like to do, um, direct this uh, question first to Mr. Orman. What kinds of conversation about culture and the civil rights movement arose as a result of the work of the Free Southern Theater, do you think? Did that make sense? Let me read again. What kind of conversations about culture and the civil rights movement arose as a result of the Free Southern Theater's work? And anybody can answer. Well, um the Free Southern Theater, uh, I became uh, introduced to or aware of um, as a young 21-year-old um, uh, acting professional in New York City. I was actually um, performing in a production with um, the um, renowned um, activist uh, theater um, creator and uh, songwriter Oscar Brown Jr., uh, who was one of my mentors, friends, and um, advisors and, uh, and, and colleagues. I was actually on stage with him in New York uh, at the Gramercy Arts Theater doing a production called The Worlds of Oscar Brown Jr. when he came into the dressing room one day with a, with a, a, a village voice article about this troupe of theater activists who were touring plays, revolutionary plays, about the issues of the civil rights movement throughout the Deep South in Mississippi and Louisiana, Georgia, Tennessee. And he brought that to my attention because, in his mind, that's where I need to be. That's what he said. He said, Roscoe, this is where you need to be. And after reading the article, I agreed with him. I said, wow. Because by then, you know, I had um, um, been somewhat involved in not just following the movement, but I was, a, I was at the March on Washington, uh, you know, and was a part of that whole feeling of 
you know, uh, change that was happening in this country. So I set up uh, uh, an appointment with one of the founders of the Free Southern Theater, who was visiting New York at the time, Mr. John O'Neill. Yeah. Yes. And in the course of that meeting, through John's um, indescribable philosophical musings, <laughs> <laughs> I was completely sold on the idea of what an incredible, life-changing experience this would be for me. And also, what, what, a, what an important contribution I would be making if I could bring my gifts and talents to this company. And uh, he convinced me of that, uh, you know, on one meeting. So, uh, within a few months, I was on a plane heading south. and. Um, uh, I, I will mention that uh, one really s uh, amazingly serendipitous occurrence uh, during my trip was we were changing planes in Atlanta and uh, while waiting at the gate for my connecting flight to New Orleans, which is where the theater had moved by then, I noticed a commotion of, you know, some rumblings and, and I saw this group of maybe five or six black men coming towards the, the gate. And this was a, a time and a place where there were very few of us blacks in the airports traveling and flying around the country. And I was actually the only one until I saw this group coming. And there was a commotion among all these, these um, white passengers who were obviously alarmed by the fact that one of those men was Martin Luther King Jr. himself, who came to the gate, and upon seeing me, he came right to me with his hand extended. Now, you can imagine the, uh, the shock and delight and amazement to, to know that Dr. King himself was, was giving me this benediction to come south. He, he, he came and, and, and uh, shook my hand and, and in the most magnanimous way was embracing the fact that I was um, heading, you know, to this troupe of young performers. And uh, I'll, uh, I kind of saw it as a, as a real benediction and, a, and, a, and, a, and an encouragement for what was to come. Um, of course, the other passengers there were in total shock and uh, consternation that this, this, um, this man who, mo most of us today don't realize the fact that the majority of white America did not believe in Dr. King's dream at that time. There was this, he was truly a revolutionary figure at that time in history. But for those of us who had become among his followers, he was um, a tremendous force. Um, so, um, that's, that's uh, the story of how I got here to New Orleans and beca became a member of the early uh, incarnation of the Free Southern Theater. Would you like to also address some of the, the same question, Dr. Derby? I know. You want me to restate the question? You could. Um, the question was about conversation. Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, we certainly had a lot of conversations about how we were going to support the theater uh, financially.